Welcome everyone to History Revealed, Closing Time with Bill Lindicky and Andy Sturdivant, sponsored by the Ramsey County Historical Society and the Eastside Freedom Library. Please see the websites that are on the slide. Click on those for more information on upcoming programs. And I'm going to stop the screen share, turn it over to Peter Ratcliffe from the Eastside Freedom Library. Thank you, Robin. Um, and I'm delighted to be here representing the library. Um, we've had a great run with Ramsey County Historical Society, <clears throat> co-sponsoring these programs, uh, History Revealed, virtually every month. Um, the Eastside Freedom Library is now six years and a couple months old. Uh, our mission is to inspire solidarity, work for justice, and advocate for equity for all. Um, we combine the resources of books, uh, material objects, musical recordings, visual art, um, with programming. These days, almost all of our programming is online. I want to invite you to, as Robin said, visit our website, see what's coming up. Um, tomorrow night is our monthly labor history film. Uh, we're showing a film called Up South about African-American migration at the time of World War I. Um, next week, we have a labor history reading group meeting, uh, reading an unpublished essay about dining car waiters in the Twin Cities. Um, so there's lots of untold stories that we're trying to tell and ways that we're trying to involve um, various members of our communities. So um, I want to thank Andy and Bill for their willingness to do this tonight and thank Robin and Chad and the Ramsey County Historical Society for being great partners. And I'm sure we're all in for a great ride this evening as we explore closing time. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you to the East Side Freedom Library. We appreciate their partnership and working with Peter and with Clarence and all the volunteers at the East Side Freedom Library. Um, we, as Peter mentioned, have been partners in programming for about two years now. And we will be working with the Eastside Freedom Library to present a number of programs on suffrage in conjunction with our upcoming exhibition, Persistence Continuing the Struggle for Suffrage and Equality from 1848 to 2020. Please see our website at www.rchs.com for more information on the exhibition, which will be premiered on our website on October 8th at a very special event. And everyone is welcome to sign up for that free Zoom event, which will be a lot of fun. We will be talking to the artists who created special artwork for that exhibition. So again, see our website at rchs.com for that. And please also consider supporting the Eastside Freedom Library and the Ramsey County Historical Society. Both of, both of our organizations rely on the support of our members and friends like you to continue to present these programs and continue with all of our efforts. So let me turn it over to Andy and Bill. I have a brief introduction. Bill Lindicky, PhD, is an urban geographer and writer who focuses on how our environments shape our lives. He wrote MinPost's Cityscapes column from 2014 to 2017, has written articles on local food and drink history for City Pages and The Grower, and has taught urban geography at the University of Minnesota and Metro State University. He writes a local urban blog at Twin City Sidewalks and is a member of the St. Paul Planning Commission. He is the author of Minneapolis St. Paul, Then and Now, and of course, Closing Time. Andy Sturdivant is an artist and writer living in Minneapolis. He has written about art, history, and culture for a variety of publications, including City Pages, Belt, and Minneapolis St. Paul. He currently writes a regular column for Architecture MN, and for five years, Andy wrote The Stroll, which was a great weekly column on Twin Cities neighborhoods, art, history, and architecture for MinPost. He is the author of Potluck Supper with Meeting to Follow, as well as Downtown, Minneapolis in the 70s, and of course, in conjunction with Bill Lindicky, Closing Time. So welcome, Andy and Bill. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Robin. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, actually lovely to be back here at the Eastside Freedom Library because 
Um, this is where I, I met uh, the editor for this book, Josh Leventhal from the Historical Society Press. Uh, you, you remember that night, Andy? I do. That's right. Yeah, you were giving a presentation not unlike the one that we are about to uh, embark upon. Yeah, and I do believe it was the first time that Peter had been to the dive bar a block, a block away from the library. Um, we dragged him to it afterwards, uh, a little bit reluctantly, I think, um, but uh, a good time was had by all. Um, it's kind of sad to be talking about bars right now because uh, they technically are open, but I haven't been to any um, except for one patio um, experience just because of the coronavirus. And I, I fear for the future of a lot of the places that are still open that are in our book. Yeah, actually two of them, I think, have ceased to exist in the time between now and, and when the book was published last fall. Yeah, that's true. But it's it's because of the um, the George Floyd unrest rather than uh, the, um, the pandemic, I believe. That's true, yeah. But, uh, so folks, we have you here for 50 minutes and uh, what Bill and I are gonna do here, and, and we can we can kind of do this however you'd like, it's your evening. Um, we, we both picked uh, five bars each from the book for a total of 10 bars. And we're just gonna kind of quickly go through them roughly in chronological order. Um, we tried to spread them around St. Paul in Minneapolis. Um, we tell you a little bit about how the book came together and that'll inform uh, some of, of what we discuss over the next you know, 50 minutes together, but um, the Historical Society Press approached us uh, a couple of years ago about about doing this book. There had there'd really never been like a kind of survey of um, of bars in the Twin Cities, kind of going all the way back to the 1840s to the present. Um, there had been some some academic texts, and there there was actually a really good um, thesis, like it was a PhD thesis, Bill, that came out. I don't know. Yes, indeed, it was a geography department thesis, so it was my. Uh a historical colleague of mine in, in the geography department. I'm, I'm looking at it right now, Bill. It's on my shelf. I need to Yeah, you still haven't given that yeah, back well, to me, Andy. It's like, it's like one of four copies in existence. Um, so so what we did is, is Bill and I w went out to, uh, you know, a couple of bars over the course of a, you know, a few weeks and, and really just kind of made like a master list of places that we wanted to get, places we thought might be interesting to write about, and types of places that we knew existed but didn't know exactly what they were like you know what was a woman-owned bar in the you know in, in the 19 teens um and so working from that list we more or less split it down the middle and um and it was he, actually sort of a fantasy football style uh draft <laughs> process where we we picked uh number one choices and then uh then deal, that's how it went i believe and a lot of it just had to do with like which bars we had the best photos of. Like there was a couple of places I wanted to write about and we just couldn't find photos of them. Um, because that's the thing when you're researching a book like this, you realize like photos of these places, if they exist, it's generally for like insurance purposes or they are tucked away in somebody's house. Um, like the, you know, the, the grandchild or great grandchild of the original owner. Um, and in some cases the photos are like on the walls of the places if they're still around. Um, but you know, a lot of a lot of this stuff doesn't kind of make it into the formal historical record, which is one of the reasons we really wanted to write this book because there's there's so many ways. Ooh, pardon me there. Uh, I'm drinking a beer, as you may have noticed. Um, so I cheers, Andy. So am I. Cheers, cheers <laughs> to you too, Bill. Um, <laughs> But when you're looking at history of the bars, you're looking at history of immigration and labor and race relations and you know, socioeconomic status of various neighborhoods and gentrification. And it's really this lens that you can look at it any number of ways to think about how a city works and how the people in that city relate to each other. Um, and it tends to be a history that, again, doesn't really make it into the, the formal histories unless a PhD student in the geography department in 1980 writes a history of it, in which case, you know, great. But um, but so getting some of those stories is what we really wanted to focus on. And so, um, so yeah, do you want to- I think the list also had a, sort of a spread of, of uh, geography and time. So we definitely wanted to have some stuff from the very early uh, colonization of this, these cities that we're, we're in and um, stretching all the way to the present day and bringing it to the present moment and, and but also spreading out the geography as well. So having a mix of uh, bars from different places around St. Paul and Minneapolis, making sure all the neighborhoods got represented a little bit. Yeah, or most of the neighborhoods. I mean, 50 sounds like a lot, but actually it's, you know, it, it goes, it's, uh, those slots got, got, got taken pretty quickly. 
All right, I'm going to jump over into the old presentation, Bill. Um, like I said, Bill's got five, I've got five, and, and we'll, we'll just kind of do this. And I, um, I will be keeping an eye on the chat. So if you have questions or comments or things that you wish to express to Bill and I, uh, please put them in the chat and I will, I will give voice to those. Yeah, so the American House was a, um, one of the earliest bars in the book. Uh, we started with a couple of saloons from the 1850s, but the American House had been around from the 1860s to 1883. And I, it was featured in a lot of uh, the newspapers because it was a block from the um, offices of the St. Paul Globe, which was sort of a uh, newspapers back in the 19th century were very um, florid and colorful. And so the descriptions of the American House that are that we found in the record there are just amazing. The other reason that it's in the book is because there was photo of it. So do uh, you want to jump to that, Andy? Yeah. So like, it's pretty rare to see a, a photo like this to find this in the Historical Society archive. And I, I love this picture. You can see um, the people uh, up on the second floor. So a lot of the saloons were hotels, right? Um, at the same time that they were a bar. And the folks gathered here are, I think this, this photograph is from 1873. So um, St. Paul in 1873 was uh, just at the beginning of the railroad sort of connections where um, it was it was it was booming, but there was also a financial panic, and so people are out here um, for all sorts of reasons. But um, immigrating to St. Paul, and uh, they they would often come to the American House, and so if you look through the city directories, which are the, uh, an excellent historical resource that I think both Andy and I, and everyone at the Historical Society or the Ramsey County. Um, use, but it, it, you see all these ads for all the different businesses, and then there's sort of addresses of, of the different people. And a lot of folks just put their, their address as the American house. So if you were coming to St. Paul to Minnesota to, um, you know, make a land claim or, or whatever, uh, you would stay at the American house for a while to sell some property or to buy some property or, or whatever. And, um, and then the saloon would be where everyone would hang out and, um, and discuss all the matters of the day that were that were important. So uh, this photo is is really the reason why I uh, we put this in the book. Also, it, it, the the idea of American had a different valence back then. So American sort of referred to um, it would this would be in contrast to like the German house, the Deutsches House, which was also uh, like a place in St. Paul. It was it was located right near the where the state capital is today. Um, but the American house would be sort of for the Yankees, right? And then the Deutsches house would be for the Germans and the, there maybe would it be a Swedish house or something like that too down the street somewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just read this really quick newspaper account of a story from election day, um, 1878, okay? Because I, I, I love this, this tale. So um, there was an article in the, in the St. Paul Globe that, um, that led the front page uh, in 1878. And the article's headline was Gill Filler Gobbled, which is a little weird. So gill like a fish, gill filler gobbled. Um, here's, the, here's the detail. A knockdown drag out row with parties engaged in the passage of the compliments of the early morn. Tom McGovern, an employee of the waterworks, had been out all night electioneering. The fatigues of the night's work forced McGovern to go into the bar room of the American house to brace up. There he met Kelly. Kelly's eyes wooed up as if he too had been electioneering, or more likely, as if he had been electioneered. They discussed the situation and slightly differed as to which was the true policy to be adopted in running the governmental machine. High words and very low language led to blows. In the struggling, they got into an adjoining card room. The door was locked and they proceeded with all their fun, all alone, depriving several bystanders of the delight in the ex exhibition. In the midst of the political discussion, Officer Kennelly came along and arrested both disputants before the argument had been fully completed. Kelly seemed to have some strong points and the McGovern also appeared to have responded with force. So it is an election season right now as well. And I, um, I think we have sort of returned to this level of uh, pol polity here in the, in the United States and in Minnesota. But yeah, the American house was a place where the, there's a piano in the corner where the old timey guy is banging on it. And uh, people are constantly getting into brawls. And when you walked in, like through the swinging door, it looks like that is a literal swinging door on the corner there. 
uh, people would turn and look at you funny if you weren't from around here. And it was just all the cliches of the Wild West. And it was, it was pretty funny, I think, to imagine uh, St. Paul being like that. So uh, it's, a, it's a good story and it's definitely a fun uh, image. Bill, there's a question here kind of related to this. How many people, this is from Steve, Stephen Griffith, how many people would a typical bar of this period hold and would there be tables and chairs or would it only be standing room? Well, there was definitely, so this is a good question and it's hard to imagine. I mean, the way that I, I actually went to New York City while I was writing the book and I went to this place called McSorley's Pub, which is in the East Village area. And it's, it claims to be, and it seems very much like a 19th century saloon that's been preserved in, in sawdust, not in amber, but in sawdust. Um, and you walk in there and you can really get a sense of what the atmosphere for a saloon like this might've been like. Um, and yes, people will definitely have gotten their mail sent there. Um, and, and then also there were tables and so there would be meals served. So if you stayed at the American house, you would come down to the saloon area. There's probably a bar area and then a, a back room where the fight took place in this case, right? Um, where people would eat, um, eat their meals during the, during the morning and presumably a dinner time meal. I don't know how many meals you get when you're staying at the hotel. But yeah, it, uh, you know, it wasn't always brawls. The brawls made the newspaper and the, the time that the bartender threw a glass at someone who called him a name and he stu stumbled out of there bleeding and fell down in the street. That's in the newspaper. Um, yeah, the reason why we know what so many of these places looked like on the inside is because reporters, you know, especially from places like the St. Paul Globe, which was very, you know, took a very, uh, uh, you know, colorful view of, of kinds of events around town. Um, you know, reporters would go in there and just kind of hang out. And if they were looking for a story, they would, you know, talk to a couple of the folks there and see what was going on and just kind of paint these florid pictures of the, you know, the, the velvet wallpaper and the fixtures and all this other sort of stuff. Yeah, and uh, the, the saloons were owned by, this one was owned by a specific person that's in my notes, um, Gil Potgeiser. And so he owned this bar, this saloon, and then I think he uh, owned a place across the street after this place was closed. Um, it finally got torn down. Um, and this is where the Lowry building is located today. So probably in the 1880s when St. Paul was really in its peak boom years and um, new buildings were getting thrown up left and right. And so um, this kind of, this corner of the city was definitely the hot property. And that's all about the American house. Okay. <laughs> yeah, a little slow there, thanks. Um, and so this is uh, the Eureka Bar at Fifth and Minnesota um, from 1887 to 1899. Um, don't have any pictures of it. Could not find any pictures of it. They may be out there, but um, I sure couldn't find them. But um, when you, we were writing this book, the, the, one of the great pleasures of it was just meeting these really interesting people. Um, and this is one of the interesting people that we met. This is Thomas Jefferson Sr., who was the co-owner of the Eureka Bar. Um, it was owned uh, by him and another guy named John Cunningham. Um, who had moved um, from the South uh, in the, um, you know, 1870s, 1880s to St. Paul, and, um, you know, kind of became two of the focal points of the African-American community at the time. Um, and the Eureka was uh, the bar that they both ran together. It had a, like four different, there are three different locations over the course of, of the decade or so that it was open. Um, but just in the accounts of it, you really get a sense for what a, a kind of social and political and, uh, you know, in every other way kind of hub for the uh, black community in St. Paul at the time. Um, and, and you start to see the kind of really inter interesting intersections between people's lives and, and what goes on at the bars. Um, at the time, St. Paul was a very democratic city and Minneapolis was a very Republican city and, and bars really did have political affiliations. And one of the things about Jefferson and Cunningham that was so interesting is that they were two of the first black Minnesotans that switched their allegiance from the Republican party to the Democratic party. And so that was, that was just a big kind of to do. Um, and there was a lot of conversation about that. And these two guys were really involved in the life of the community. Um, you know, with the lack of a kind of a social safety net, um, the bars became places where you know, you could cash a paycheck or you could get, uh, you know, in some cases a loan if you were in need of one. Um, and even kind of mutual aid societies and mutual aid is, is one of these things that we hear so much about now in the last couple months. 
Um, and there were mutual aid societies or mutual aid like societies that were going on in places like the Eureka. You know, there were all these accounts of if somebody got sick, then, you know, Cunningham would pay for the, the doctor's bill. And if, if somebody died, then Cunningham would pay for the funeral um, and have some money for the widow that they would raise through the, you know, through the folks at the bar. Um, so the Eureka bar just really, it, it really felt like a, you know, just kind of getting to know these guys and, and getting a sense for, you know, what their lives was like just through these, these snapshots. The reason I was able to find so much about the Eureka bar in particular is because um, a lot of the research process had to do with what newspapers were digitized and what newspapers were not. The St. Paul Appeal, which was the black owned newspaper in St. Paul um, in the late 19th century and early 20th century is digitized. So you could find, you know, advertisements and, and all of this kind of thing. Um, you could find these little snippets of accounts and then just kind of over the course of, of uh, you know, the research, you could kind of put a picture together. Um, and there were these really kind of, you know, beautiful and sad stories too. Cunningham, Jefferson's partner here, um, he, uh, you know, had a common law wife and, and there was a newspaper story about how he, you know, called his wife to his side as he was sick and they got married um, and then he died and, you know, and there was just this really kind of poignant account of that, you know, the kind of the deathbed marriage that they had. And you got the sense that Cunningham was kind of a quiet guy because the reporter went and go told Jefferson, you know, hey, did you, did you hear that Cunningham got married? Jefferson was like, Cunningham got married? That doesn't sound like him. Um, and, you know, he was dead the next day. Um, but um, so, again, these, these really kind of sad stories. Um, two questions here. Would places have had rooms above or was that rare? Yeah, almost all these places had rooms above them. There's one figure, I, I forget which chapter it's in, but like 90% of every bar owner lived above the bar that they owned. Um, and I think that was the case with Cunningham and Jefferson too, um, that uh, that at least one of them lived over the Eureka because you you could follow their addresses to the city directories and they would usually correspond to the um, they would usually correspond to the um, addresses of the bars. Jonathan Garrity asked if the Eureka Bar segregated in the 1870s. Um, I mean, it was it was a de facto segregation. It was, I mean, I think I get the sense, and it's it's hard to know with any certainty how integrated it was, but um, I mean, it, it seemed like it was primarily um, an African-American bar, um, which is not to say that you know, there, there weren't white folks in there occasionally, but the sense that I get it, it was, it was really, you know, it was really kind of created for the black community and mostly patronized by the black community. Bill, did you I come would, across I, anything? I, yeah, I would throw in, in the 1870s in St. Paul, there was still uh, a kind of a culture of the, um, you know, mixed of uh, even fur trade type stuff, like, because um, a lot of St. Paul had been settled by uh, a more diverse population that it that it ended up being after a lot of immigration came. So I kind of imagine that a place like the Eureka would have had a mixed clientele of um, all sorts of different people. Yeah, and kind of to that point, uh, Steve and Griffith asked what it took to get a liquor license and where they limited number and how much did they cost. And, and yeah, that's... Um, <laughs> the, one of the things about the Eureka that kind of made it stand out is of the 312 saloons that um, were operating in 1887, the only one that was owned by, um, where a license was granted to black owners was the Eureka. Um, they they raised the price of the license to $1,000, which at the time would have been just an exorbitant amount of money. <laughs> um, yeah, the licenses were a big way that um, people in government tried to crack down on uh, on a lack of sobriety in in the population so saloons were you know seen as a problem by by many people especially business the business community and the and the, and the church religious community um, and they were like people drank a lot in the 19th century uh, yeah kind of to the point of being a public health crisis I mean it was really you know there was a lot of alcoholism um, but the, especially when we get to Minneapolis, you'll see how the, the liquor licenses are really kind of weaponized for political and social purposes and in a pretty blatant way. Um, I see the, this other question, Andy, is about closing times and set hours. Um, I'm, I'm not, I actually don't know about when they would have closed at night, but I do know that uh, liquor uh, bars open on Sundays was a, a hot button politically for a while. 
Yeah, most of the bars were closed on Sundays. Um, and in fact, you get a lot of accounts of, of like a lot of the times when these places turn up in the public record, uh, it's because they were open on Sunday and a cop was walking by and slapped a fine on them and, you know, it got written up in the paper. Okay, so this is one of my favorite uh, bars that's still around. It, in fact, is the oldest uh, bar in St. Paul to this day. Um, there is, there's an older bar in North St. Paul, or at least they claim to be. But the Spot Bar is a wonderful little joint on Randolph Avenue that dates back to 1887. So that's just so rare in the United States, to, in, especially this, this part of Minnesota, to have a place that's been around that long. Um, do you have a photo of it, Andy? Oh yeah, there it is. So um, I, I've been, I'm a frequent goer to uh, goer to the spot bar. Goer um, tour, I think is goer the word. Goer tour, <laughs> and uh, and it's uh, it's a lovely little joint. Um, and uh, I'll just talk about. I described this painting in the um, in the in the chapter, but it's a painting that was done by a patron, um, and it hangs up on the on the wall. And he apparently um, painted painted it um, and so you can see the longtime owner um, I think his name is Michael O'Toole and the bar is still owned by the um, the bartender owner's wife who keeps it um, in his memory uh, Mr. O'Toole died at some point I'm not sure when um, maybe 10 15 years ago but um, I was sitting at the bar and commenting on this painting and someone um, the bartender looks up is oh yeah uh, well you know um, George there uh, right next to you is in the, is in the painting and I, I turn and I look and I see an old guy and, and it might be one of the younger men here at the at the bar and he's sitting next to me and he's he has he's in the exact same pose that he was in in the painting um, so I just I just kind of like it but this place is a, a lot of character the jukebox is still there um, researching the history of it I learned at one point there was an organ player that uh, was in the back corner um, you see, I saw this in, a, in an old movie once, like uh, I think it was the movie um, The Long Goodbye, a Robert Altman 70s film. Um, and uh, so where you go into a bar and then there's like a karaoke set up kind of like at Nye's Polynesian room back when it was still uh, the old Nye's and, um, and someone to play the organ and then you'd sing along songs. And apparently that was true here at the spot bar as well. And the reason I know that is because there are newspaper clippings that are shellacked on, um, on like placards along the side of the walls of this bar today. And they have some stories by um, this guy who was a columnist for the Pioneer Press named uh, Gareth Hebert, but his pet name was Oliver Town. And apparently he used to hang out at the spot bar a lot because he wrote a lot of columns about the spot bar and what people were discussing in the 70s and 80s back in this place. And so because they're shellacked on the wall, that's a great way to do research. You just literally go in and get a beer and sit down and you can read about the, the bar while you're sitting there in the booth. So um, I, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, Everyone should go there when COVID's over. They're, they're open now. They put plexiglass uh, in between the booths, um, which I don't know is sort of symbolic. But yeah, it's uh, St. Paul's oldest bar. Yeah, if we'd, if we'd written this book six months later, um... I think we would have had to have included a chapter about some of the modifications that have been made to to bars uh, in the last couple of uh, last couple of months. Yeah, here's another St. Paul classic joint, uh, the Halftime Rack, which is um, there's a couple different bars in the book that were featured in films. So um, the uh, a bar that's gone now that was it's called the King of Clubs. It was in Northeast Minneapolis was the setting for a scene in the movie Fargo. And um, this was during the, and then um, the Halftime Wreck, which is there a photo of it, Andy, here? On, it's on Front Street in a kind of historic neighborhood um, in St. Paul. In the, I, I call it the, the North End, but it really is a unique spot on Front Avenue. Um, and um, I know about this place because when I was growing up as a teenager, my uh, family took me to go um, do square dancing and folk dancing, um, much like you see in this photo right here, except these two are doing Irish dancing. But um, it's, it was a bar that started as a recreation hall. So if you picture it full of pool tables or whatever. Um, and one of its it, more, more interesting features is that there's in the basement a, a, a weird bocce court that I think some Italian uh, American St. Paulite had created on a whim. And it's, uh, it's sort of musty and it's surrounded by the limestone walls of the 
of the basement that dates to the 19th century, I'm sure. And, um, and then you, you play bocce in the basement, but. Yeah. If we'd had a scratch and sniff uh, option on the book, <laughs> I think that would have been one of the top scents. Like the, the smell of the bocce courts at the halftime rack is one of the most evocative I can think of. This is a good chance to talk about uh, the photography research. It was probably the, some of the most fun stuff that we did um, because uh, we would, we would um, find the Star Tribune would send people to cover stories and um, in order to get Star uh, photographs in the Star Tribune into the book, what you have to do is uh, look up what the date of the article would have been. So, you know, in this case, it's like, you know, I don't know, 1986, March 4th or whatever, right? Um, and then you go to this very dusty um, uh, boxes that they keep in the very back of the, um, of the Historical Society Library. And you fill out a little form and um, uh, one of the library staff brings to you this giant cardboard box and you open it up and there's just uh, envelopes, it's crammed full of envelopes full of photo negatives that are all the archives from the um, Star Tribune photographers. And they're all and organized by date. Oh, sorry, Bill, I don't want to step on. They're else. organized by date and they're organized by the name of the photographer. So like at the end of the day, you can just imagine that like any, you know, film they would have shot that day basically goes into an envelope. And so you would have to use your kind of psychological acuity to sort of like reverse engineer, um, you know, when the photographs would have taken. So if it appeared March 4th, you have to think, okay, so was the photographer there March 2nd, maybe March 3rd. There was a couple where I, it ended up being like he was there the week before and maybe the story was going to run and then it got bumped. And, and so it was just, you know, and again, these were negative. So you couldn't, you know, just look at them and see if they were going to be useful or not. You'd have to, you know, kind of take them over to the light table and, and get the loop and kind of, you know, check each one. Yeah, so this story was written by a young scrappy reporter named R.T. Ryback at the Star Tribune newspaper. I wonder whatever happened to, to him. Yeah, he actually played a role in, in the book um, as a mayor. But um, And then uh, he got he a photographer to come and take pictures of the halftime. And um, one of the commenters, Mary McKay, correctly um, describes what happened at the halftime. So there's you know, obviously a rich Irish culture in St. Paul that dates way back to the 1840s and and, and and uh, some of the first people who ever came to St. Paul were Irish. And so there's sort of a rich, thriving Irish um, cultural music and folk scene that um, uh, has moved around the city quite a bit. So McCafferty's was a bar that closed downtown St. Paul. And then um, the whole band and all the fans moved to the halftime. Um, the, the owner decided it was okay to have Irish, Irish people come in. And, uh, and now the place is known as an Irish bar and has a, big St. Patrick's Day blowout, of course. And it's even where the um, Irish, uh, the Irish Institute or the Irish, um, there's an Irish society that, uh, that, does, that does the Irish fair in St. Paul every year, or at least until this year where nothing happens. Um, and they were sort of loosely organized around the halftime for a while. So I, I just love these photos because you capture that, that spirit. Um, and those, you know, the, the, the sandals and shorts guy, I, I'm enjoying him and it's just uh, you can see the crap on the on the floor there, and it's it's really uh, it's really wonderful. Sorry, oh, Bill, here, you're here's kind of another one. Kind of back back to back uh, St. Paul joints here. Yeah. Do you wanna do you wanna just chronologically switch it around, and you wanna do one? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll I'll jump ahead here a little bit. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I'll talk about the Cassius Bar. Um, the Cassius Bar is another one of these instances of just finding a really amazing character um, and kind of following his or her life through the bar. Um, and the amazing character in question here is Cassius himself, uh, Anthony Brutus Cassius, um, who had come up from the South um, in the, the early part of the century and had gotten a job at the hotel, uh, I think the West Hotel, I think as a dishwasher in the kitchen and immediately it kind of got into unionizing and organizing. And so he was, uh, um, you know, one of the kind of key labor folks for um, the, uh, you know, the hotel industry and the service industry um, and a lot of the organizing that went around then. Um, and he was based, um, you know, around like 4th Avenue and 38th Street in, in South Minneapolis. 
um, you know, not at all far um, from where Cup Foods, um, the murder of George Floyd by the Minneapolis Police Department uh, occurred. Um, and historically, that's that section of Minneapolis um, is, is, you know, is a major African-American section of, of the town. Um, you know, the spokesman recorder is still there. And so he was there and he owned a cafe there and he owned another bar elsewhere. But what he really wanted to do was open um, like a nice bar, <laughs> like with a, uh, where people would come in for dinner and, you know, they could get like pork chops and steaks and they could get martinis and, you know, aviations and sidecars and all the other fancy cocktails that, that people drank at that time. Um, and so he was in two different locations. Um, started in 1949 um, is when he opened the Cassius Bar. And that was a long, long process because you get back to the conversation about liquor licenses. I always thought of liquor licenses at this time as, as kind of ghosts where they would move from host body to host body. And, and the only way uh, it could leave the host bodies if the host body died or got arrested or something like that. And that's usually what happened. There were a set number of liquor licenses and uh, if a place got shut down or the person decided to sell it, it would go to somebody else. And the person who made the, the people that made the decision about where that was going to go was um, the city council and the, the public kind of health commission. Um, and, you know, there had, there was not a, a hard liquor bar at the time that was owned by um, an African American. And so, you know, the Minneapolis city council found all these reasons to not grant cash as a license that weren't like explicitly racist, but were just sort of like, well, you know, doesn't his nephew already own a place? And isn't there someone else that wants to own one? And also you know, this isn't really a good neighborhood for it. Um, and, you know, he made a very forceful argument and eventually, um, you know, actually kind of in a way that was related to civil rights, kind of made the civil rights case that, that he should be permitted to have one. And so he was granted one in 1949. Um, he owned uh, and operated the first Cassius Bar from 1949 to 1958. And then um, the city demolished the building in 1958 and moved into uh, another building um, on Third Street. It's the problem with downtown Minneapolis. Um, addresses and bars is it's just so hard to picture where these places are because the entire landscape looks so different <laughs> and, and and it's it's just kind of you know i can't think in my mind like okay third avenue and third street where is that exactly um and it's also that, just the um the bar area of downtown minneapolis got completely demolished and yeah. there's no building standing from the where all the bars were located and yeah, we'll talk about that. But you know, you can see that this is like a pretty like upscale crowd. Like these are folks like they're coming in in like nice clothes and you know like having again like <laughs> sidecars and martinis and I guess there's no martinis in this picture, but certainly mixed drinks. Here's a cup of champagne. The woman on the right is is drinking. Um, and you know, another one of the kind of great like side things. This picture didn't make it in the book, unfortunately. Um, but um, I can't remember why not. Um, That's a great picture. Well, there's a whole subgenre of like bar art, like oh, art yeah. that you find in bars. And so this was this was a, a mural that was uh, commissioned um, by Cassius, uh, by a, a a guy who had been a boxer. It was called the Rondo Street Jinx, and he had a second career as a painter. And so this is uh, Sugar Ray Robinson and Carmen Basilio. Um, you know, just the, so it, it, there were these four murals in the caches of kind of, you know, uh, great moments in African-American athletic achievement. I think there was like a Jackie Robinson one and I think maybe like, uh, you know, the Sugar Ray Robinson one and probably a um, Joe Lewis, I think. And one of these, one, I forget which one it is. I think maybe it's the Joe Lewis one, but actually Cassius had been at that. And so they painted him into the front row and he's got like blood all over his face because it was such, such a violent fight. Um, and when it closed down in 1980, it's, it really is a kind of generational thing because there was a long interview with him and, and he was just this really kind of respected, you know, pillar of the community. Um, you know, he knew all the politicians and they asked him why he closed and he was like, well, the kids just want to like smoke marijuana these days. They're not interested in getting a sidecar, which is, is not untrue. That is definitely the way things were going in 1980. Um, so, you know, you, you do see these generational shifts. Um, speaking of the the bars of the Gateway District, um, let's see here. This is the Great Lakes Bar and Fun House at First and Nicollet. So this is right where the um, what used to be the ING building. I forget what it's called now, but um, you know the building. Uh, 1949 to 1960. Um, 
so, you know, some of you that are a little older perhaps may uh, remember the Gateway District um, and what was called Skid Row at the time, which is, you know, basically Hennepin, Nicollet, Washington. Um, that is where if you were uh, you know, an itinerant worker that was working on the railroad or, you know, like harvesting weed up in North Dakota, um, you know, you'd come back uh, during the, the off months and you would live in a single occupancy room, you know, over a bar and, and you would spend most of your day drinking. Um, and so you had this really kind of rich culture of, you know, it actually sounds like a pretty, I guess, varied culture of, you know, downtown workers and kind of railroad workers and agricultural workers and, you know, I mean, all sorts of just folks from every walk of life. Um, and the Great Lakes Bar and Funhouse was one such a, the one such place. Um, this was one of those situations where I managed to track down the daughter of the guy that had owned the place. Um, the 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 Great Lakes in particular was owned by a, um, a Croatian immigrant um, that had come to the United States and, and had dreamed of opening a bar and, and, and did indeed open a bar. Um, and so when I say it's a fun house, like you think, oh, okay, so it's like, it's like a fun house where like people have fun and it's a house. Well, uh, no, it was, it was actually a, a literal fun house. John Subak was the name of the owner. And he just seems to have had a really kind of goofy, very goofy, very kind of Midwestern, mid-century sense of humor. Um, so in the back, he actually opened a fun house where there were like guys jumping out in gorilla suits and there was like, you know, puffs of air coming up from the floor to blow the dresses up and, you know, like fun house mirrors. Um, and in the front, there was just wacky stuff going on all the time too. There was like, there was a floor show that they had often where, you know, they put on like a saxophone record and a guy would come out like pantomime, I mean like this sweaty impassioned sax solo, but he'd be playing a kielbasa. And, you know, like the, the ashtrays were all like hospital bedpans. Um, and it was, you can kind of get a sense for that. Like if you go into the bathroom, apparently there were, there were all these kind of ribald um, <laughs> things that you would see. Don't hold it too long. Look gals, here's a strange one. Um, that's There's cool. actually still a bathroom like that at Newman's in North St. Paul, which is another old school bar. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jonathan Garrity says hall of mirrors and cocktail sounds like a dangerous combination. It was, I think one of the best stories that I came across was, I don't know, you hear all these stories today about how, you know, oh, youth are kind of trapped in this arrested development and, and you know, nobody asks their age and all that kind of thing. But there was a story about a, a guy, there was a fire one night, like kind of a not serious fire, but there was a fire at the Great Lakes and they had to call in the, you know, the fire department and like evacuate everybody. And this one guy was just having such a great night. And he was so mad that he got kicked out that he like, he knocked out two firefighters and ran back in while the fire was still going. I don't know what he was going to do there. He was just going to keep like hanging out or just like work around the flames. Um, and they, they had to drag him out um, just because he was, he was just having too good a night and just didn't want the fun to stop. Um, but John Subak had, I mean, I think it kind of speaks actually to the community that was around at that, at that, in that place in time. Because, you know, Skid Row gets a, a bad rap, obviously. It was like definitely a seedy, dangerous place. But there were, you know, folks there that knew each other. And, and so when the city condemned um, the Gateway District in 1960 and the Great Lakes was forced to close, like a couple other bars, um, you know, he didn't know what he was going to do. Um, there was no payout from the city. Um, it, it was a, you know, there, were, there was no kind of payout that he was going to get. Um, so one of his regulars, apparently, just all according to his daughter, um, just made a handshake deal with him, you know, loaned him some money to get back on his feet and open a new place. Um, and, uh, and he did. And apparently he paid the guy back in full. And, you know, because the guy that lent him the money knew that he was good for it. Um, and the bar that John Subak actually opened was the 5-8 Club uh, in... Minneapolis, the other home of the Juicy Lucy. And I think there's probably an interesting story there too, but um, I did not get that story, whatever it was. Cool. Um, let's go back to some of the ones we skipped over uh, at this point. Let's see. Uh, the Nickel Joint is another bar that's still around and uh, it's in Frogtown. So it's actually located a block from St. Agnes Catholic Church. And I got the sense that, um, you know, there's not a coincidence that uh, the bars and the churches would be located near each other because uh, that's what community is all about. Um, and if, in fact, after church, you would go there. And um, is there a photo of it, Andy, too? Yeah, it's a I really... Just, 
Oh, sure. So that's the, um, the, the first time I heard about this bar was because of the, uh, the baseball museum that was in the back. There's this big event room in the back of the Nickel Joint Bar where um, this society that's in St. Paul to this day, it's called the, um, the Old Timers Baseball Association, uh, meets there and has met there for decades and decades, um, once a month during the off season. So generally November to May uh, or maybe April. Um, anytime there wasn't baseball. And, and this, this society was started in like the 1920s by uh, some minor leaguers for the New York Yankees who were in the Yankees system. And they were bored during um, winter and wanted to get together in St. Paul. And so they um, began meeting at bars around the city and it just kind of kept going. And, and as, as baseball shifted throughout uh, St. Paul and in Minnesota, they evolved as well. So now they're sort of a twins fan group and they, um, did these so they meet they meet every every month um, and sort of there's usually like a discussion of the minutes and the budget and there's pictures of very very cheap lager uh, American lager that you can drink um, and uh, and then there's usually a trivia contest and some sort of story about like a famous baseball player uh, in Minnesota history and so they've had apparently multiple mayors have been uh, members of this society and uh, they have guest speakers come in who are maybe former pro ball players or umpires or um, whatever and talk about uh, stories that they know. So anyway, the, uh, the back room of the nickel joint was until about two years ago covered in these photos of um, baseball teams that had been around in the early 20th century in, uh, in St. Paul. So back in the early 20th century, uh, every um, business would, you know, host a team and they would so if you had a shop, like one of them was the Tool and Derek, the De the Derek and, jo and, and Joint co Company, like they're, they're still around, I think, over on the riverfront. Um, but they would have uh, nine players in, you know, classic old school baseball uniforms. Uh, and they, they would show um, the picture of their um, their team. And so the, all the walls of this place were covered in these old photos. And it's very, very cool. Um, to see that. And so this is, I think, one of the uniforms of the Nickel Joint Club, the baseball club. So it was really neat to, see, to be in this place and see all the history of all the different um, um, ball teams that go back in St. Paul um, for 100 years or more. Um, and I th uh, the bar was sold to uh, Ethiopian uh, uh, two guys from Ethiopia um, a couple years ago, and they wanted to use the back room for events. So they preserved some of the baseball history. I, I imagine 100 year old baseball history doesn't mean a whole lot to uh, new Ethiopian immigrants. Um, you know, so someone, uh, I, I actually went and talked to the guy uh, a couple times about it, but he did save the photos and they're um, kept in a, in a closet. And then a couple of them are on the wall still that you can see. And so it's, it's kind of an interesting place to go and see that. Um, and then uh, here's another bar in St. Paul that is sort of famous, the Commodore Hotel. So um, this is near the, the, the cathedral on Cathedral Hill, Ramsey Hill. Um, and uh, the Commodore Hotel, if you, it reopened, um, thankfully, a couple years ago. So you can go back there again today. Um, but it had been a sort of a residential hotel for most of its life. Um, uh, like a hotel that you stay at for a year maybe or a month, um, but for a period of time. And um, famously, F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald stayed there in the 1930s um, before the end of the prohibition. So um, there might have been a speakeasy in the basement, but they might have just been drinking moonshine there. And, and so all the cocktails that are at the Commodore that are branded with F. Scott Fitzgerald um, are probably not accurate entirely. Um, the famous incident that happened at the Commodore. So it was sort of a swinging place to hang out in the 1970s, apparently. Um, there was a kind of jazz in the 1980s as well. So there's a jazz band that played there all the time and um, uh, you'd go and have cocktails and it was sort of part of this renaissance of the Ramsey Hill area, which had been in decline for quite a while. And then um, sort of historic preservationists and um, um, long-time residents sort of managed to turn the neighborhood around and it started to um, get get nicer and this was one of the pivotal places that played a role in that story um, but uh, there was a big gas leak so this photo that you're looking at right now is what happened after an explosion 
Um, and I'm trying to find the, the year. I think it's, I have to find what chapter, there it is, um, 1978. So it was kind of uh, extreme. Like the building was pretty old and the, the heater, um, you know, the gas started getting out. And uh, the way that the story was told in the newspaper quite a bit, um, the uh, one particular like janitor was running through the hotel and knocking on all the doors and getting all the people out at the last minute. And um, there was a small explosion and that's what triggered everybody to start panicking. And then they try to get everybody out of the building. And then the whole thing just blew and all the windows blew out and the houses across the street blew out as well. Um, and, uh, and somehow the building did not get uh, destroyed. And so it's still there today. And now it's uh, condos, I believe. And um, there's a restaurant. I don't know if they're open right now. Um, but yeah, uh, Peter points out that August Wilson wrote some of his plays while sitting at the bar at the Commodore. The Commodore bar is a really beautiful spot. It's, very, it's art deco. So it was remodeled at some point in, I think, the 1940s. Yeah, after Prohibition, when a lot of places were um, sort of rebooting after that long uh, bar free time in our country's life. And um, so it was sort of remodeled. There was actually the same guy uh, designed the Commodore Hotel, the Lexington on Grand Avenue, and uh, this place that was called the Townhouse, which is now called the Black Heart on University Avenue. Um, and he was a Hollywood set designer. Um, and he was a German, he had a German name. I, I, I have to look it up. I don't remember it offhand, but he did all those places. Um, and they're all sort of campy and uh, sort of wonderful in retrospect. Yeah, and it really, it does, the thing that I like about that place is it really does look like a 1980s version of a 1930s film set. <laughs> or it looks like a 2010s version of a 1980s vision of a 1940s film set. Yeah, it's a really unique uh, environment and, and I'm glad it's been restored and reopened to the public. So it sat sort of empty, or it was, you could rent it for um, private events for a couple decades and then it got rebooted about three years ago, I, I think. So I'm going to power through these last two. Uh, I'm going to do the power hour here, the 12 to 1 o'clock, uh, just turned 21. Um, the Red Baron, uh, 2017 6th Street, 1966 to 1969. You might be thinking the Red Baron, where? Um, yeah, kind of an obscure place. Um, the reason why this is included is because this is one of those things where the research kind of drives uh, you know, what's going to go in the book. So I was looking through the bar and restaurant files at the... Um, and in the county library in the Minneapolis collection um, because they have, you know, just kind of clippings from the newspapers, community newspapers, the Strib, you know, Pioneer Press. Um, and there was one envelope that I came across that said, first woman bartender, 1966. And I thought, gee, 1966 seems kind of late to have the first woman bartender. Uh, but indeed, that was the case. This is Judy Jarosak. Um, at the time, uh, women were not permitted to be bartenders in the city of Minneapolis. They were permitted to be cocktail waitresses, which is a very different kind of situation, obviously. Um, but Judy Jarosak was a member, um, again, because we're doing this at the Eastside Freedom Library, we always got to uh, point to the, the union and labor angle. Um, she was a member of the, the waitresses and the waiters um, union. And uh, she wanted to join the bartenders union because she had been working at, um, I think the, um, it was one of the, it was one of the downtown, I think it was the Rich Sheraton uh, across from where the library is now, but she was a, you know, a cocktail waitress there and she knew how to mix drinks and she wanted to get a job as a bartender. Um, you know, she was putting herself through school to get a sociology degree. She was a single mother, she was divorced. Um, and so she passed the test and apparently got the, the highest, you know, the highest commendations of the, in the history of the, the bartending uh, admitter, admission test. Um, and so for one night, she was hired by these guys at this place called the Red Baron, um, which had replaced another bar that was called The Office. And you know why it's called The Office? It's like that mid-century joke where you call your wife and you're like, hey, I'll be working late at The Office tonight. And apparently, this is a side discretion, they actually had like sound effects um, 
like of typewriters in the background by the phone. So it would sound like you are at the office. I don't know if that's true or not. Anyway, that place burned down. Um, and so these guys bought it, opened a place called the Red Baron, which had kind of that kitschy like mid 60s, like World War One kind of theme that eventually became like kind of the TGI Fridays like style of, of kind of bar decor. But anyway, so Judy Jarasek worked there for one night um, and they were going to use it as a test case. Um, because they thought that that when she was working her one night there, that the the vice squad was going to come in and arrest her, and they were going to be able, you know, the Minnesota Civil Liberties Union was going to be able to use it as a test case. Um, but what they actually ended up doing is is giving a citation to the bar owners, and, and there was a, a court case, and um, and eventually it was overturned, and women were permitted to be bartenders in the city of Minneapolis. But as for Judy Jarasak herself, I don't actually know what happened to her. I really tried to track her down and just she kind of vanishes from the historical record after like a year. And I, she got a lot of publicity and it wasn't good publicity necessarily. I mean, it's probably a pretty rotten thing to like, you know, <laughs> have your picture like splashed across the pages of the, you know, the newspaper and be the kind of the subject of like this, this kind of intense interest and gossip. Um, you know, single divorced mom putting herself through, you know, university doesn't need that. Um, so she kind of disappeared. Um, and the reason why the Red Baron was only in operation for three years um, is not because I mean, a wooden, wooden bartender scandalized the place. Um, it burned down. Uh, it, you know, the, you think, ah, oh, the 60s, that's not actually that long ago, but it is kind of a long time ago. And there was still, I, I think, I think you're still looking at this building stock that, you know, kind of came up in the early 20th century that was just very flammable. And so it, it burned down, basically. Um, and that was the end of it. Um, an interesting thing about the Red Baron is that there was a place next to it called Vincent Van Gogh, which I think is maybe in the, of all the great names that we encountered of establishments in this process, I think Vincent Van Gogh is way up there. As long as they like follow through with the decor inside, I think it's, that works. <laughs> Who knows what the inside of the, what the inside of the Vincent Van Gogh looked like. Um, but so yeah, it's short, a short time um, for the Red Baron. And the last one I'll just talk about really quick is just, I think one of my favorites, just um, this is this is getting into like living memory now. I, if any of you actually went to the left guard, please uh, chime in in the, the comments because I am obsessed with this place. Um, the left guard was opened by a couple of Green Bay Packers. And, and I think there's people here that probably know the Green Bay Packers better than I do, but it was the, two of the guys from the, you know, the ice bowl uh, team. Um, but they opened, uh, it, it's actually, if you know where, I think it's the Menards down like at, um, down in Richfield at, um, where did I say it was? Nicollet and 77th down that way. Um, and it was just, it was an old Piggly Wiggly. So it was just this warehouse. And apparently at the time, it was the most profitable singles bar in the country, not in the region, not in the state, not in the Midwest, in the, in the whole country. Um, Apparently there were 3000 people in there on a really busy night, which is just impossible to imagine that level of kind of grinding humanity. Um, <laughs> and it was a place for like people at the time that were considered to be older. Um, and by older, I mean in their early thirties. Um, so it, it was definitely the, the, you know, the kind of, this is the, the sexual revolution coming to um, the suburbs of, of uh, the twin cities again, which is funny because like, it was a place opened by two former Green Bay Packers and the decor sounds exactly like what you would expect two former Green Bay Packers to decorate a restaurant. Like there was like big images of like Minnesota Vikings, you know, on the, on the wall and, and like the bartenders wore, uh, you know, apparently like kind of football jerseys and, um, you know, it just sounds like it was a, a really kind of funny place. Um, it, it got a write up in time magazine. Um, and I think I, if I may, the, the best quote that we have in the book, um, if I can find it here. Andy, look at these, this picture, this, the, the two collars on this one guy who's checking out the girls. He's going in for the kill. Oh my right? God, those <laughs> double, the double collar. And then this, the light fixtures are so classic 70s. They look like and, the knives. Uh, yeah, yeah. They, they absolutely do. You can see the, it's in black and white, but I can see the, the, that brownish orange color uh, through the photo. Yeah, it's um, yeah, and the photos of this place also came from that 
um, the kind of the Star Tribune dump, um, and you get the sense that these photos have probably not seen the light of day for, you know, maybe ever. Um, Mary McKay th says um, the cocktails. So when when did cocktails go out? Bill, do you want to address that? I mean, I, I have some uh, ideas, but I don't. I don't know. I, I, don't like know. A... I mean, craft beer is doesn't arrive until the late eighties and. The, Minnesota. But and that's what Cassius says in 1980 is that by that time, um, the people that were coming to bars just weren't interested in cocktails anymore. Um, they were interested in, you know, like beer and wine. Um, and so I think that cocktail culture really good. And I don't know, some of you that were drinking in the 80s probably remember what the cocktail culture was like. We actually, the town talk is in this bar too. And, and if some of you remember, you know, in like the mid 2000s, late 2000s, the town talk was really kind of on the forefront of the, the craft cocktail um, movement. Um, and the guys that were coming out of that, you know, had worked in like, you know, hotels and downtown restaurants and like cocktail culture in the eighties is very like, you know, it's like Tom Cruise, like flipping things behind his back and like setting stuff on fire and like neon pink synthetic uh, cocktails with very ribald names. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of what you're looking at. Um, but the left guard had, had a, a profile written of it in time magazine for, you know, for whatever reason. Um, Here's how it opened. Time Magazine said we had a drink called the Thigh Opener. Left Guard General Manager Dick Smith complained to the Star Tribune in 1974, sounding extremely annoyed. Well, that's not true, and it still is it. We just call them vodka gimlets. <laughs> I, I hope there's a appeal of chuckles kind of going through, going through the houses that are tuned into this. But um, yeah, Wolfie uh, Browender uh, says there was a fuzzy Thurston's left guard in Glendale, Wisconsin, a Milwaukee suburb. My parents and grandparents took us there once when I was about six. I have very vague memories of eating there in the mid 60s. And it was the same chain. Uh, fuzzy Thurston was the, the Green Bay Packer in question. Um, and so, you know, he opened um, a couple of these, I think, in a few different places in the Midwest. But um, the one in, in the Twin Cities, for whatever reason, was the the largest. And as far as the capacity, um, which someone else is asking about, Jonathan Garrity is asking about the bar's capacity. It was, it was outrageous. Um, let me see if I can find the exact figure. Yeah, the, there were, um, there's a football bar in downtown St. Paul still to this day called Allery's that was started by a former Chicago Bears player named Al something or other. And his partner was Larry. So that's why it's called Allery's. Um, and uh, and so football players or sports figures would start bars. That's a pretty normal uh, thing that still happens today, I think. Yeah, but they just don't always turn into like, you know, kind of pivot points for the sexual revolution. But here they did. Um, I don't know what the exact capacity was, but on a, on a like above average night, it was 1500. And um, like on a good night, it was 3000. So that's... It's a lot of people. A lot of people. <laughs> Plus, I think like the 494 strip was pretty hot back in that period. Yeah, and that's the other thing too. I mean, that was kind of the point where you, you're starting to hear about Bloomington as being kind of the third the third hub in the, the tertiary cities. Um, you know, and it was like, you know, Met Stadium was right there and the airport was right there. So it was really like a combination of, um, you know, like pilots and flight attendants and like you know football players and just like really the kind of the the cream of the 70s scene oh and Stephen griffin said he was there when it was max millions it was huge yeah so it closed it became max millions which was was kind of like a, a mexican themed um bar and restaurant and maximilians eventually beget chi chi's and so chi chi's as a fast casual concept was born right here with the left guard that's uh that's that's where that's famous, famous Mexican culture of Bloomington. Oh, right. What a journey from a, you know, a, a singles bar and a Piggly Wiggly owned by two former Green Bay Packers to a fast casual Mexican restaurant by the stadium. Like that, that is the, that is the journey of a lifetime. <laughs> well, um, I don't know if there's more questions, uh, how, how much longer we should just keep blabbing. The book is got 50 stories like this and we barely scratched the surface of, of what's in here. So uh, if you don't already have a copy, uh, you definitely should get one because it's good. That's true. Are there are questions from anyone in the in the audience today about uh, stuff that we talked about or didn't talk about? Stuff that we missed is always something we're interested in hearing about. Yeah, I'm sort of curious about like, uh, yeah, uh, anything about the oh the nineteen eighteen flu pandemic? That's a Did that great, come up. 
No, well, not in the research. I wish it had now. Um, yeah, so to Jonathan Garrity's point, um, no, the bars were forced to close and it was it was an extremely contentious issue um, as it is today. Um, and th at the time too, you know, the, 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 the flu pandemic is kind of coming in perfect confluence with World War I and kind of prohibition about to start. Um, and if you look at drinking, if you look at World War I, um, you know, and you look at the pandemic, you're, you're kind of looking yep. at this sort of pan-European sort of othering, right? Like, so a lot of these bars are run by Germans. And of course, we're fighting the Germans in World War I. Um, and so there's a lot of anti-German sentiment. Um, and so a lot of the, the kind of forcing the, clo the bars to close through the public health order, I think probably had a lot to do with um, the fact that so many of the bars were owned by Germans. Which makes and me sound a, like the 1918 version of like a QAnon conspiracy there's, theory. There's a, gen, a gender uh, thing too with uh, a lot of women and the suffrage movement that Robin was talking about at the beginning was very closely tied with the um, temperance movement. Um, so when women got the right to vote, also it, it helped uh, sort of seal the deal for bars and prohibition. Um, and uh, yeah, what was the impact of prohibition? Well, uh, the bars mostly cl closed. Um, you could get... Yeah, a lot of them turned into pharmacies, which was a or sort soda of, pop shops like soft drinks. Yeah, and the speakeasies to some degree, but um, pharmacies could give alcohol to people if you had a prescription, uh, which is sort of funny. Prohibition did really, I mean, it really, I think it did a couple of different things. It actually, I don't know, I, have, I didn't think about this until now, but thinking about like World War One, it really kind of de Germanized bars in an interesting way. I mean, I think before prohibition, um, you think of bars as being very, you know, especially bars that are serving beer, you serve them, you see them as being very, a lot of them are owned by Germans, you know, they're, they're um, patronized by Germans. Um, and so there's a really kind of German quality to them that I don't know, kind of goes away, actually, after after prohibition, because it really does, it's like a hard reset, you know, so few places survived. Um, and, and, but but when prohibition was over in 1933, I think it, it, um, the floodgates of, of places that opened up that um, it was it was all very exciting for people and just every, most most of the bars in the book that are still around got their start in 1934. Um, yeah, it, it's it's uh, so the they all opened at the same time. What's a spot that we researched we really wish we could have visited? Andy, do you have an answer to that question? I do. I super apologize that this is going to make anyone sound old, but um, the new French bar <laughs> in the 1980s, which some of you probably went to once or twice, um, it just sounded like a really fun, cool place for uh, cool, arty people. Um, and as a person that has always strived to, to, to uh, fit that description. Um, it just sounds like it was a really, really fun place. Um, I, I got to talk to um, a couple of the folks that were, you know, involved in opening it and building it and just, um, uh, you know, just the, 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 there was so much intentionality around the way that the space was designed and just the way that they kind of handled customers. And, you know, it was one of the first places where you could get like a summit beer in town one of the first places where it had a patio where you could bring a dog so i mean it's just like so much of it sounds so 21st century <laughs> but that's my answer yeah my answer would be moby dick's bar in downtown minneapolis uh, i would like to go there in like about the year i was born 1979 just to see the descriptions of it are very exciting to me um and it's just sort of a lost slice of downtown that i i don't think there is anything that is like that today um yeah the other effect of prohibition was on the, the beer industry and um uh, the reason there was a lot of consolidation during that period where the breweries that could stay open grew very large afterwards and the ones that a lot of the small ones shut down. Yeah, and, and there was a whole, you know, one of the things that went away, I think, to some extent after Prohibition is the idea of the Tide House. Um, a lot of these bars were kind of propped up by local brewers where, you know, the 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 brewers would, the breweries would pay for the the fixtures and the interiors and everything, and they would just supply the beer, and and it was only only the beer from that brewery that was that was uh, that was available there. Yeah, and the, a fun detail about that is if you go to certain bars, you'll see the same floor tile um, <laughs> on them. So uh, there's like a, a the Viking Bar on the West Bank and uh, Palmer's Bar and um, like another one in Northeast all have the same brown and white tile. 
And it's because they were all owned by um, the same brewery and they, they would hire the same contractors to build all of them. So you could kind of use the floor tile as like a secret Dakota ring for the history of the place. <laughs> yeah, people's moms, dads and uncles and aunts. The, the, the story about, about Moby Dix that is really, really hard to, to, to believe is, but I believe it, is that if you went in there with the Alcoholics Anonymous bracelet, um, or, or metal or whatever they give you for being sober for a period of time and you gave it to the bartender, they would give you the rest of your drinks for free that day and they would nail it up on the wall. Um, so that's not ideal for public health, but it's certainly kind of amusing for alcoholics story. for alcoholics to talk about. It's a, it's a line you have to walk when you're writing a book like this. <laughs> <laughs> like between kind of like fun, colorful stories and like sort of human suffering. Um, yeah, yeah. We uh, we did a reading actually, uh, the opening, our, our kickoff party where the bouncer from Moby Dix actually came to the reading. And so he's he was in the book, a guy named Clarence, and he uh, he showed up and he's like, oh yeah, that's me. And so he actually sort of uh, bounced Andy from the stage at one yeah, he point. Yeah, he gave it, I asked him to give a demo of how you would uh, effectively kind of bounce somebody. And he was, it was great because it was not the strong arm. It was really like this kind of persistent, subtle application of force, the kind of a, a cajoling mixed with a, you know, sort of like, uh, uh, yeah, which is a kind of gentle application of, of, of brute force, which is a very effective way to, to bounce somebody, it turns out. Another sort of local story, if you're um, from St. Paul and on the east side, the closest one to the Freedom Library actually was the, the Pain Reliever, which uh, was a, a strip club and bar uh, that was in uh, St. Paul East Side staple for uh, decades, I believe. And um, so the book has a little bit of history of that place and some of the battles between the city council and the, and the bar owner who was a real character. Obviously, we could talk about this all night. Um, <laughs> we'd be happy to, but um, I want to be respectful of everybody's time and Robin and Peter and uh, all the nice folks at the RCHS and the Eastside Freedom Library. Well, thank you, Bill and Andy. This was a fantastic talk. And again, thank you everyone for coming and or giving us your time at home for this uh, wonderful program. And please check out both of our websites for upcoming programs. And also check out our partner, Subtext Books. Um, they have been wonderful partners with us pairing the books for our History Revealed program. So again, thank you, Bill and Andy, and thank you to the Eastside Freedom Library. Please come back again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, folks. See you around. Thank you.